Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study here at the Bible Tabernacle here in Venice. Uh, we just want to continue to thank God for allowing his word to uh, pour forth uh, through this ministry during these very difficult times. And uh, so we want to uh, begin our lesson this evening, but before we do, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will get right into our lesson. Eternal God and Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus today to say thank you for who you are, for you are holy. And you and you alone are perfect in all of your ways, and our minds can't even comprehend the magnificence of your holiness for your holiness is from everlasting to everlasting. And we thank you that because you are holy, you are a righteous God. And it is because of your great righteousness, Lord, that we have assurance. And that we have confidence and that we have comfort. And your righteousness shines stronger and brighter than the sun. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, that you are compassionate and kind and meek and gentle. And we thank you, Father, that you are full of grace and your mercies are new every day. We thank you, Father, that you and you alone are a perfect, loving Father in every way. We thank you, Christ Jesus, for who you are, eternal Son of God, who sits on the throne of God, on the right hand of the Father. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you that you are Redeemer, Deliverer, and Savior. And we thank you for the price that you paid that we will never know in order to bring salvation into this world by taking the sins of the world upon yourself and enduring the wrath of God, the very punishment that we deserve. We thank you, Christ Jesus, that you loved us and gave yourself for us. We pray tonight that as we look into our lesson, Father, that you would teach us the spirit of unity in this ministry and throughout the body of Christ, wherever we go. That you would help us to understand that we are all one body led by the Spirit of God to benefit others. So thank you for what you're going to teach us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you know, we're studying the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, this Corinthian church, it had a lot of problems. There was so much disorder in the church, it's even hard to believe that they were really Christians. But Apostle Paul, he called them in the third chapter, carnal Christians, or immature. You know, they, they weren't immature because they were new Christians. Uh, they were immature because they weren't feeding on the word of God. You know, the real meat of the Word of God, Bible doctrine. And the church members, they were behaving like children. Well, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. And one of the biggest problems in the church was disorder at public meetings. Now, in our last two lessons that came out of chapter 11... The Apostle Paul, he dealt with some of the women who were dishonoring God and man by refusing to wear head coverings inside the church meetings. Also, Paul dealt with disorder at the Lord's Supper. You know, the wealthy people, they weren't sharing their food with the less fortunate at their love feast. And people weren't coming to the Lord's table or commune with a right heart attitude. Uh, there were also confusion concerning the use 
of spiritual gifts. A lot of problems. They were confused about how to properly use their spiritual gifts. You know, this Corinthian church, it had been really greatly enriched with spiritual gifts. But they weren't using them to edify one another. So now in chapters 12 and 13, Paul's going to address this issue of spiritual gifts by looking at the church body. And let me stress, he's going to address this issue of spiritual gifts by looking at the church body. You know, one of the marks of maturity is a growing understanding and appreciation for our own body. Well, the same principle applies to our spiritual life. As we mature in Christ, we gain a better understanding of the church, which is Christ's body. Now, Paul, he used many images in his writings to describe the church. He described the church as family. He described the church as an army. He described the church as a temple, even a bride. But in three of Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, he emphasized the church as a body. And as in all three of his letters, he brought out the same three important truths. He brought out unity, diversity, and maturity. Now, it's impossible to talk about the body without talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit who gave birth to the body at Pentecost and who ministers through the body. But in the Corinthian church, the members were grieving the Holy Spirit by the carnal ways they were using their spiritual gifts. They were like children with toys instead of adults using valuable tools that we need to mature. So tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, you might want to turn your Bibles there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's going to place emphasis on unity. The gift of the Spirit. Now, since there was division in the church at Corinth, Paul began with an emphasis on the oneness or the unity of the church. The church body. And he's going to point to four areas that bonds Christians to spiritual unity. Now, first... In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Paul contrasted the life they lived as unconverted idolaters. He contrasts that type of life with now their present experience as Christians. Now let me read verses 1 through 3. He says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, and I would not have you ignorant. So I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles, unbelievers, unconverted idolaters. You were, you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. So what Paul's saying here is that they had been worshiping dead idols, dumb idols, dead idols. But now they belong to the living God. And, 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 
And, you know, their idols never spoke to them then, but God spoke to them by his spirit. And he even spoke through them in the gift of prophecy. And before they were converted, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 20 tells us they were under control of demons. And here in 1 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul says they were carried away or led astray by these demons. But now the Spirit of God lives in them and directs them. And when we look here at verse 3, chapter 12, verse 3, we need to know that it's only through the Spirit that a person can honestly say, Jesus is Lord. I remember when Jesus was having a conversation with Peter and he asked his disciples, who do you think I am? Who do, they, who do you say I am? And some said, well, you're this person. And some people tell us that you're that person. He said, but who do you say I am? He says, well, Peter says, well, you're the son of, you're, you're Christ, the son of God. And Jesus replied, well, this didn't come to you through man, only through the Spirit. So, a, a disingenuous sinner might be able to mouth those words, but he's not going to give a true confession. He might say it out of his mouth, but he doesn't mean it in his heart, is what I'm saying. So, when the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives... We also have control of our lives. And that's going to be an important issue in this lesson tonight, control. So, and so any so-called spirit manif manifestation that robs a person of self-control is not of God. And I'm reminded of many times when people in different denominations and, you know, areas of so-called Christianity will lose control. Ah, ah. But what does, God, what does Galatians 5, 22 and 23 say? That the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So I don't know much about all that losing control and claiming the Holy Spirit is leading you to do that. I don't really understand that. But if Jesus Christ is truly Lord in our lives, then there should be unity in the church. That's the issue. Division and disorder among God's people only weakens our testimony. It, re it weakens our testimony to the lost world when the people outside of the church look and see that we're, we're walking in disunity, in division. It, 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 it tears up our testimony. So Paul said the gift of the Spirit bonds Christians in unity. The gift of the Spirit bonds Christians in unity. So what Paul's saying is that to this divided church that he's writing to, because we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, there should be spiritual unity. And he's saying we should be bonded together, first of all, because we confess the same Lord. And that's what Paul was, 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 was sharing with us in, in the, in, from verses 1 through 3 that, that we should be bonded, we are bonded together because we confess the same Lord. Now secondly, in 1 Corinthians 12, chapters 4 through 6, Paul tells us we depend on the same God. You know, first we confess the same Lord, 
And then we depend upon the same God. You and I depend upon the same God. Let me read verses 4 through 6. He says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which works all in all. He's saying that, that in order to operate, in order to administer in the, in the, in the body of Christ, that we have to depend upon the same God to get it done. We depend upon the same God to get it done. You know, and you can definitely see the three persons of the Trinity involved in this passage. The same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. You know, individually, we might have different gifts or ministries or even ways of working. But Philippians uh, chapter 2 verse 13 tells us it's God which works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So it's God working in us and through us to accomplish his good pleasure. And that's, we have to depend, each one of us depends on him to do that. We can't do it on our own abilities. So the source of the gift is God. And the wisdom and the energy to use the gift is from God. <laughs> then why should we be glorying in men? And why... Should we compete with one another? We confess the same Lord. We depend on the same God. Now here in verses 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11, Paul's going to tell us that we minister to the same body. We minister to the same body. We confess the same Lord, we depend upon the same God, and we minister to the same body. You know, these spiritual gifts we have are given for the whole church. They're not just for individual enjoyment. No, they're to edify or build up the church body. And the Corinthians, they needed to be reminded of this because they were using their spiritual gifts to selfishly promote themselves and they weren't prospering the church. You know, when we accept our gifts, whatever they are, with humility, then we promote harmony or unity that helps the whole church. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of the healing, what? By the same Spirit. To another, the workings of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretations of tongues. But I once want to include chapter verse 11. It says, but all these worketh that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. All of these different ministries, all these different gifts all come from what? The same spirit. Uh, the same spirit that, that, that gives uh, Pastor Hills the, the spirit of ministry is the same spirit that gives the workers around the, 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 the property here the spirit of helps. The same spirit. The Spirit of God gives us our gifts. 
And these various gifts that Paul just named, uh, along with the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, when you combine them with the gifts spoken of in Ephesians 4, 11, and also the gifts in Romans 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, you end up with 19 different gifts and offices. And then God... He, he isn't limited to those gifts. He can give other gifts as he pleases. He's God. Let's take a minute and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. At some of these gifts here. Uh, let me read verse uh, 28 here. He says, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after, the, after that, miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, we already, uh, in our lessons, discussed apostles back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, the prophets who were New Testament spokesmen for God, whose messages came immediately from God by the Spirit, and 1 Corinthians 14, 3 tells us that their ministry was to edify, encourage, and comfort. Now let me just turn there for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. And it says, But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So we need to remember, as we move forward into this lesson, we need to keep in mind the theme of this passage. You know, the foundational uh, idea that Paul was teaching us has to do with unity in the church body, being united together. You know, Christians using their spiritual gifts as led by the Holy Spirit. In, in Paul's letters to the Romans and the Ephesians, he emphasized the same teachings about unity in the church body. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. We're going to see that Paul is, is teaching, is sharing the same, putting emphasis on the same message, unity. Unity in the church body. He begins, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And here he goes. Verse 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body, are one body, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. You know, there's emphasis on these also turn to Ephesians, and let's look at that. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 6. Paul was writing to the Ephesians here, and he says, I therefore, the, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation which you are called. 
with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. See, there's this, this emphasis on unity. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the in the bond of peace. That that word endeavoring means means to, to means an, an action, taking action or or putting effort effort. It takes effort to keep unity in the spirit in the bond of peace. It takes energy, it takes effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It just doesn't happen on its own. We, have, we need to strive to accomplish it. And then he says what? There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called and one hope of your calling. And he's saying the same thing he was saying in Romans. Even as ye are called in the spirit, one hope of your calling. What? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. He's talking about unity, oneness. Oneness in the body of Christ. And, and, and I also want you to take note that in the Gospel of John, in the 17th chapter, when uh, Jesus was leaving the upper room with his disciples and he stopped in the middle of, of, of leaving the room and he looked up to heaven and began to pray to his father. He's standing there surrounded with, with, by his disciples and he just stops and he starts praying in their midst. I can imagine they were probably in awe as he, as he carries out this conversation, this intimate conversation with his father. And first he prayed for himself, and then he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for you and I. And what did he pray for you and I? Of all the things that he asked the Father, he prayed that you and I would be united together. That we would be one just as Christ was one with the Father. And so that we would also be one with one another and one with him. People, somehow we need to get the message of unity in our hearts towards one another. At every level. It's an indication that you're being led by the Spirit. Because unity is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Are you exercising that gift? It's available. But now let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be uh, looking at verses uh, 7 to 11. And in, in here, uh, in verses 7 through 11, Paul's going to describe some of the spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit. Let's read those verses 7 to verses 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of the healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. And another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one, the same self-spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. You know, so before we look at into the meaning of this list that Paul gives of these spiritual gifts. The book of Romans and the book of Ephesians also gives us a lift, list of spiritual gifts. And uh, turn your Bibles to Romans 12 and we want to look at verses uh, 6 through 8 and look at these gifts once again with, uh, that, uh, that Paul has given Romans chapter 12, 
verses 6 through 8. And it says, having then different, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, or, or he that exhorteth, or exor exhortation, he giveth, let them do it with simplicity. There's a gift of exhortation. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy, there's a, there's a gift of mercy, a gift of cheerfulness. And so, these gifts, they go on and on. Uh, turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. And let's go through those, those, those gifts again. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 12. He says, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And here it is. And he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ. Why did he give us these gifts? Well, he tells us right here. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are to use our spiritual gifts to edify the body of Christ. Now, turn your Bibles back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 11. Let me read uh, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now, the gift of... So the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge would parallel with Ephesians 4.11, where we just looked at, where Paul was speaking of pastors and teachers. It would parallel the same gift. Pastors and teachers, they instructed the new converts or converts into doctrinal truths of the Christian living. They, they had wisdom and, and, and understanding, uh, this uh, uh, knowledge. This gift. And uh, speaking of pastors and teachers, they were taught from the word of God and from the teachings of the apostles. You know, they were unlike those prophets that you know, the prophets, they didn't get their message immediately, unlike the prophets, I mean. Unlike the prophets, the, the pastors and teachers weren't getting their, their message immediately uh, by the Holy Spirit, although the Spirit does guide them in their study and teaching. You know, that's very interesting. I, I see that. You know, as a, as a pastor, a teacher, uh, we need to come before the pulpit <laughs> prepared, studied, with a lesson plan. You know, I, it, it, I'm hard-pressed to understand, to come before the pulpit and just Totally depend upon the Holy Spirit to give you a message right then and there. 
You can tell the difference. You need to prepare. You, you need to have a plan. You know, it's, it's a gift to be used, but it's a gift to be used properly for the building up, for the teaching of the church. You know, uh, back then there were these prophets that the, that the Lord did give these, these, these inspirational messages immediately that were given to the people. But that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about pastors and teachers today. So, uh, you know, and like I said, although the Spirit does guide pastors and teachers in their study and in their teaching. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 9 speaks of the gift of faith, and that's an interesting gift. Now, this gift is different from our saving faith, which all believers possess. This gift of faith that he's talking about here is exercised in, it's flushed out in persistent prayer and endurance during very difficult times. It, 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 it's shown in that this gift is shown by people. You know, you have some people who are just absolute prayer warriors who pray and pray and prayers of faith continually. You know, it's a gift. Also in verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9, we see the gift of healing. Well... Now, that subject could take up a whole chapter by itself. But healing was a temporary gift. It was a temporary gift given specifically to the apostles and the 70 men who Jesus sent out. Now, this gift was given to them to authenticate that these men truly came in the name of Jesus. Nowadays, the Holy Spirit witnesses or testifies through the word of God, through the Bible. Now, looking at the gift of miracles here in verse 10. According to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In the early church, miracles were part of the credentials of God's servants, of the of the apostles. Of those he sent out, that was those were those were part of the credentials of God's servants, and that was in uh, in in the early church. Let's look at Hebrews, chapter two. Hebrews chapter two, uh, verses one through four. He says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. And here it is, verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both in, with signs, he's speaking of, the, he's speaking of those, those apostles, those, those, those ones that Jesus has sent out. He said, and I'm going to go back, he says, he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them, speaking of the apostles and that heard him, God also bearing witness, bearing them witnesses, witness, both with signs and wonders and with different miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And so, uh, there was a time then, you know, uh, 
there were miracles. You know, in fact, miracles, healings, and tongues, they all belong to what theologians call sign gifts. They had a special place back in the beginning of the church age. And these gifts were signs. The signs that demonstrated that the person using them was an authentic representative of Christ. And in some cases, uh, there was proof of indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the book of Acts as well, as church history indicates that these miraculous gifts have passed off the scene. Now, God is still in the miracle business. God is still in the healing business. I'm sure that there are certain times that in, in certain situations where the Lord is using tongues at, for some purpose. But for the most part, these gifts have passed off the scene. Now, there's some other spiritual gifts not mentioned in this particular list, such as evangelists, which are certainly important. They're mentioned in Ephesians 4.11. The evangelist, his main focus was sharing the gospel to the lost. Very simple. Reaching out to the lost with the gospel of Christ. You know, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.5, all ministers should do the work of an evangelist and win souls. All ministers. It's just not limited, but there are, there is that gift. You know, some men and women have that spiritual gift, that special calling for evangelism. You know, Billy Graham is our greatest example. He just naturally had that, that gift to, to evangelize. Everything he, he lived and breathed was evangelism. There are some of us who have to really work at it. We have to study and practice to, to be able to, to be uh, effective evangelists. Now, we have to look over to, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 again to find the very important gifts of helps and governments. And that helps and governments have to do with serving others and guiding the church. Now this gift speaks of church leaders or possibly deacons, but all those that have the gift of helps, it could be in any ministry in, in the ministry, such as the cooks, the, the people that work in the office, the people that do administration work, the drivers, and all these comes under the heading of helps. Yeah, but without these deacons or, or, or these church leaders, uh, without spiritual leadership, the church is going to flounder. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, Paul mentions tongues. Ah. Now, the there were several speaking gifts. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. We're going to have a lot more to say about that later. So, you know, Paul's going to break it down for us to help us understand. But that's later on in our lessons. But the point is, Paul, he doesn't exhaust all the spiritual gifts in this passage, but there are a lot. Some students, they categorize these various gifts as the speaking gifts, the sign gifts, the serving gifts. But the point is that we shouldn't be so fascinated by these individual gifts. So fascinated that we forget why Paul listed them. He wants to remind us that they unite us in our ministries to one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 tells us, 
The Holy Spirit bestows these gifts on us as He wills, not as we will. So no Christian should complain about his or her gifts. Neither should any believer boast about his or her gifts. Now here in 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 12 and 13, Paul tells us we're many members in one body. Ministering to each other. Let me read chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, where do we read that before? Over in Romans. For as the body is one and has many members, and all members that, that of one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have, we, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So we want to notice here in verse 13 where Paul gives us the fourth reason that we're bonded in spiritual unity. Remember, first, he said we confess the same Lord. Second, we depend on the same Lord, on the same God. Third, we minister to the same body. And finally, here in verse 13, Paul tells us we've experienced the same baptism. And when Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans and the Ephesians about unity in the church body, he used the same reoccurring... You've, you've heard it all through this lesson of this reoccurring theme of unity. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through seven, and we read these verses, but we want to look at it again because he's 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 repeating the same things over and over and over and again. People, when are we going to get it? Listen to what he says. Beginning in verse three, endeavoring, you know, striving, and you know, making an effort, putting some energy into. Keeping the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Why? Because there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. When are we ever going to get the message that we are one? Should be no division. So he used the same reoccurring theme here. And so now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, where Paul tells us we've experienced the same baptism. Now this term, baptism of the Spirit, it's been greatly uh, misinterpreted and greatly abused by some doctrines in many churches. You know, the baptism of the Spirit happens the moment of conversion when the Spirit enters the believer's sinner and gives him a new life. And we will find that where out in Ephesians, like chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where, the, where Paul told the Ephesians that, that the moment that they, they, they heard the Word of God and believed the Word of God, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So all believers have experienced this once for all baptism. Once for all. You know, nowhere in scripture tells us to seek this baptism because we've already experienced it. And it doesn't need to be repeated. Now the filling of the Holy Spirit that Paul spoke of in, in Ephesians chapter 5 is different than baptism of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit has to do with the Spirit's control of our lives. Remember I was 
sharing earlier how it's, it's about allowing ourselves to be controlled by God. But c controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so the filling of the Spirit has to do with the Spirit's control in our lives. In Scripture, to be filled by something means to be controlled by it. You know, we're, we're commanded to be filled. We're controlled. We're commanded by God to be, to be filled and to be controlled. And, 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 and we can if we surrender to Christ and ask Him to fill us or can take control of our lives by His Spirit. You know, this filling is a repeated experience. Because we constantly need to be filled or, or controlled with, with, by his spiritual power so that we might glorify Christ. So to be baptized by the Spirit means we belong to the body. We belong to Christ's body. But to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit means our bodies belong to Christ. We're being controlled by Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 14 through 16, tells us the evidence of the Spirit's baptism is the witness of the Spirit living inside of us. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. Verses 14, chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. And Paul writes, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Here it is. Verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The evidence of the Spirit's baptism is the Spirit of God witnessing to our spirit that we are the children of God. <laughs> you know, it's not about speaking in tongues. It's certainly not speaking in tongues that gives us that evidence. You know, all the believers in the Corinthian church, they'd been baptized by the Holy Spirit, but 1 Corinthians 12.30 tells us not all of them spoke in tongues. And that's where Paul asks the rhetorical question, do all speak with tongues? Do we interpret? The answer is no. And in Acts 1.8, the evidence of the Spirit's filling is the Spirit gives us the power to witness. And he says, and you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses to me. Also in Ephesians chapter 5, the evidence of being filled is joyfulness and submission. Further evidence of being filled is found in Galatians 5. 22 to 26, and I think we want to look at that. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. And what does he say here? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things there are no such laws. There's no law against those things. They're the fruit of the Spirit. They're the evidence of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You know, um, the Holy Spirit also helps us to grow and understand God's Word. Uh, turn with me to John chapter 16. The Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. 
And here's Jesus speaking. He says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. And so the Holy Spirit uh, helps us to grow and understand God's word. Overall, what Paul's saying to us is we don't control the Holy Spirit and use our spiritual gifts to benefit ourselves. We're to submit to the Holy Spirit and allow the Spirit to control us so that we might benefit one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this evening. Uh, that you would teach us by your word, through your spirit, how we ought to behave in a way that would bring honor to you and bring glory to you. And even Christ Jesus, as you thought it fit to pray for us, that the most important thing that could happen to us while we're here living on this earth is to live in unity with one another. Help us to remember that you paid a price that we will never know in order to redeem and deliver and save us that we ought to be obligated to strive to work and live in unity with one another above all things. Thank you for what you're teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.